Welcome back to Hematology Oncology lecture number two. Let's just dive in with our first question. So as always, pause, try and figure it out, and then come on back when you want to discuss the answer. The correct answer here is B, ADP. All right, let's talk about the formation of a platelet plug which is of course the sequence of events leading us from the point of endothelial injury where we're bleeding to the point where the bleeding stops and then the coagulation cascade can start. So step one of course involves that injury to the endothelium. When this occurs, we get this transient vasoconstriction that works through a neural stimulation reflex as well as via something known as endothelin that is released from damaged endothelial cells. In step two, we have exposed collagen that will bind with von Willenbrand factor. In step three, adhesion takes place. Now in the adhesion step here, platelets bind von Willenbrand factor via the GP1B receptor at the injury site. When this occurs, platelets release ADP from boxane A2, which is TXA2, and calcium. Now calcium is needed for the coagulation cascade, and ADP will help platelets to better adhere to the endothelium. In the fourth step, that ADP binds to the P2Y12 receptors, which induces the GP2B3 expression on the platelet's surface. From here, fibrinogen binds to the GP2B3 receptors and links platelets. Okay, so this leads to that temporary cessation of bleeding, and then it gives the coagulation cascade a chance to come in and exert its effects. So just a couple real important pharmacological nuggets that I want to share with you here today. First, aspirin. It can irreversibly inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme that's needed for the synthesis of thromboxane A2, which will, of course, affect this um, ability to form the platelet plug, which is why aspirin can induce bleeding. Clopidogrel and teclopidine inhibit ADP-induced expression of the GP2B3A by irreversibly blocking the P2Y12 receptor. Okay, just a couple things we mentioned with this platelet plug. And then finally, the GP2B3A receptor is directly inhibited by abciximab, eptifibatide, and tyrofaban. Before we go on to our next question, this image here of the pathways, the coagulation cascade, there's one in your first aid books, which as I read it, I found to be very, very um, over the top and complicated. So I created just a very simple one for you here that you can refer to. Um, really, you just want to have a general understanding of the cascade. For example, the steps, you, you know, it doesn't just go one, two, three, four, five. So we know it goes 12 and then 11 and then nine and then 10. It's complicated in that it doesn't make sense. You just got to memorize it. So I'm not going to walk you through all these steps here. I would just be reading off of a picture and that makes no sense. But what I want to do is talk about some of the important pathologies and pharmacology that you would need to know as it relates to the cascade. And to be quite honest, that's probably where the test questions will come from because to just ask you a straightforward question is probably not going to happen knowing the path and the farm is. So let's look at a few of the common pathologies we need to know. And we have hemophilias as our first. Remember, Hemophilia A, B, and C, these are all inherited in which manner? Do you know? X-linked recessive. But they do have different factor deficiencies that cause the problem. So for example, hemophilia A is caused by factor 8. Hemophilia B due to factor 9. And then hemophilia C is caused by factor 11. All right, let's look at a couple of the main medications that we need to know in order to set, set ourselves up for success on exam day because, um, you know, farm is so huge. So first, the anticoagulants, thrombotics, and antifibrinolytics. The anticoagulants are, of course, going to include drugs like heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and then our direct thrombin, thrombin inhibitors like agatroban and dabigatran. We need to know their specific mechanisms of action because this is commonly tested. So let's look at those now. So heparin. Heparin produces its effects, how? By inactivating thrombin and activated factor 10. So heparin binds reversibly to AT3, and that leads to inactivation of factors 2A and 10A. And this complex of heparin with AT3 is also able to inactivate factors 9, 11, 12, and plasmin. So if you're asked, heparin binds to antithrombin through high affinity pentasaccharides. Don't forget that antithrombin is a serine protease inhibitor. 
Next, we have low molecular weight heparin. And low molecular, molecular weight heparin works by binding to antithrombin, which as I mentioned, is a serine protease inhibitor. And this leads to a conformational change that accelerates its inhibition of factor 10 in the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. As a result, the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin simply doesn't occur. And low molecular weight heparin is also able to directly inhibit thrombin. Now, the direct thrombin inhibitors, these drugs work by binding directly to thrombin and just inhibiting its ability to move forward with the clotting cascade. Remember, thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin, and then that goes on to form a clot. We also have a direct factor 10A inhibitor. That is a pixaban. And this, of course, exerts its effects by selectively inhibiting, as I mentioned, factor 10A. Now, it is able to bind factor 10A in both its free and its bound forms, meaning it's working independently of antithrombin-3. Next up, let's take a look at the other classes we need to know, the thrombolytics and the anti fibrinolytics. So let's move on to the next slide and talk about those. So thrombolytics work to dissolve clots by activating plasminogen. That forms a cleave product called plasmin, and this is a proteolytic enzyme, and this has the ability to break the, the fibrin crosslinks that give a clot its structural integrity. And we have, we have three major classes of fibrinolytic medications. They are the tissue plasminogen activators, TPAs, streptokinase, and urokinase. So in order to understand how these drugs exert their effects, we need to understand the fibrinolytic mechanism for tissue plasminogen activator. So the breakdown of a clot looks like this. TPA binds to fibrin, which is on the surface of the clot, and then this activates the fibrin-bound plasminogen. Plasmin is cleaved from the plasminogen associated with fibrin, and fibrin molecules are broken apart by the plasmin, and that leads to the dissolving of the clot. Now, streptokinase isn't a protease with enzymatic activity, but it has the capability of forming a complex with plasminogen that releases plasmin. The main difference between streptokinase and TPA is that streptokinase isn't going to seek out and preferentially uh, bind to clot-associated fibrin, meaning it will bind to both circulating and non-circulating plasminogen. This means that we prefer TPA for the most part because streptokinase will produce significant fibrinogenolysis and clot fibrinolysis, while TPA is just more specific. Okay? We also have urokinase, but that has limited clinical use. Then we have the class of medications known as antifibrinolytics, which of course, based on their name, you know they're going to inhibit fibrinolysis. Now, these work by interfering with the formation of plasmin from plasminogen by either binding to sites of the enzymes or plasminogen, thus interfering with the formation of plasmin, thus halting the process that would otherwise degrade a fibrin clot. All right, as I said, we're not gonna deep dive into this because of course this is a crash course, but I wanted to review some of the high yield information before we dive into some questions. So now that you have a little bit of an understanding and a, a fresh review of this stuff, let's see how much of the coagulation cascade and the pharmacology and the pathology you know by doing some questions. So let's dive into the next question. As always, you can pause, try and figure this out, and then come on back when you wanna discuss the correct answer. So the correct answer here is A, 9 to 9A. Nine so this is a conversion, this is a step that requires calcium. There's no trick here, you just need to know the steps and which cofactors are needed and where. On to the next question. Go ahead and pause and then come on back. Correct answer here is E. This one's pretty straightforward, and this really just requires that you know which drugs work where in the coagulation cascade. So if you were paying attention during our discussion about medications a few minutes ago, you should know this. If you zoned out, please go back, slow down the video, and add notes to the pathway I provided you in your notes so that you simply know where everything works. Now, having a more simplified version of this stuff really makes it easier on exam day, so I do recommend that you use the, the um, the image that I gave you that eliminates a lot of the you know unnecessary stuff and then just throw in things like cofactors where drugs work it's better to build it yourself you have a better understanding all right so this question is going to require that you um, understand the coagulation cascades so I'm going to put this slide 
next to the option. So go ahead and try and answer this question and then come on back when you think you know the answer. The answer here is B, two, three, four. So we haven't touched on vitamin K and warfarin yet. We'll do that shortly. But you should already know that warfarin can inhibit factors 2, 7, 9, 10, and protein CNS. So like I said, we'll get into that shortly. But let's do one more question about the coagulation cascade, and then we'll talk about warfarin. So go ahead and pause, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you're ready to discuss the correct answer. So the correct answer here is C, vitamin K administration can reverse the inhibitory effects of warfarin. So let's take a look at what we need to know about vitamin K dependent coagulation. So there's a few really high yield facts that you absolutely need to know and please make sure that you know this stuff. So first, remember that vitamin K is important for the synthesis of factors 2, 7, 9, 10, as well as protein C and S. So a deficiency will result in what? It'll result in a decrease in the synthesis of these cofactors. These cofactors are needed for the coagulation cascade. Now keep in mind, there's almost no way that you're gonna be asked simply what factors vitamin K is needed for, but you do need to know that inactive factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, in addition to vitamin K and gamma glutamyl carboxylase, which of course needs vitamin K, creates our mature carboxylated clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and protein CNS. So after that reaction takes place, Vitamin K will be in a oxidized form. At this point, it needs to be reduced, and we do this with the help of the epoxide reductase enzymes, turning it into its active form. So I want you to take a look at the image in your first aid, or you can look at the next slide in your books, and you'll see what this looks like. It is pretty straightforward. So if you look here, all you see is that we have the oxidized vitamin K, which is inactive. Epoxide reductase reduces it, making it active. And then there's the inactive factors, which through the help of a glam, uh, glutamyl carboxylase will turn into active mature carboxylated factors, 2, 7, 9, 10, and protein CNS. And you can see, of course, where warfarin would exert its effects here, which is blocking the epoxide reductase enzyme. So now that you know the basics, a few important points to keep in mind for your exam. First, warfarin anticoagulates by inhibiting the vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme, which means that we can't take the oxidized vitamin K, which is inactive, and reduce it to an active form. The second is the administration of vitamin K has the potential to reverse the inhibitory effects of warfarin on clotting factor synthesis, but fresh, but fresh frozen plasma will reverse the actions of warfarin immediately, and we can give that along with vitamin K to sort of um, handle cases of very severe bleeding. The third is that there's a classic question about newborns and their inability to make the vitamin K dependent clotting factors. So why does this happen? Well, it happens because neonates lack the enteric bacteria that are needed to make vitamin K. That makes them susceptible to bleeding. So what's needed at birth is an intramuscular injection of vitamin K. Now, the fourth thing I wanna point out to you here is that, and this isn't gonna be a straightforward question, but can potentially help you answer more detailed or complex questions. And that is that the factor two has the longest half-life. Factor seven has the shortest half-life. So of your clotting factors, two and seven are important. Two has the longest half-life, seven has the shortest. Like I said, they're not gonna ask you that straight up, but it might be useful to help you answer more complex questions. All right, so let's move on to some of the high yield important hematology and oncology related pathology with another question. This time we've got a matching exercise. So what I want you to do is take some time, pause the video here, and try and match the RBC morphology with its associated pathology. This stuff is super, super high yield. You have to be able to, on, on a dime, just answer this deficiency causes this type of red blood cell. This type of red blood cell is associated with this deficiency. So go ahead and take as much time as you need here. We won't put up the 10 second clock and then come on back when you are ready to discuss the RBC morphology and their associated pathology. So I hope you got all these right. If you didn't, please make sure that you know this stuff because as you can imagine, 
If you don't know what diseases that they are trying to get you to recognize based on information in a vignette, then you're basically guessing the entire vignette and you don't want to be guessing throughout your exam day, especially not these important exams. So let's go over the correct answers and I'll give you a bit more info that you need about each before we move forward. So the first red blood cell type is the spur cell. And this is more formally known as an acanthocyte. And there's one up here on your screen, or you can look at the one in your first aid. And this is associated with both liver disease as well as a beta lipoproteinemia. Then we have the Burr cell. This is also known as the echinocyte. And this can be associated with liver disease, end-stage renal disease, as well as pyruvate kinase deficiency. So if you put this side by side with the acanthocyte, what you're going to notice is that it's smaller, but it also has these uniform projections. Okay. Next up is the dactrocyte or the teardrop cell. Now, these are the consequence of bone marrow infiltration. So when the bone marrow gets infiltrated, the red blood cells are squeezed out and they're squeezed out into a teardrop shape. Next, we have the schistocytes. These are also known as helmet cells. And these are fragmented red blood cells, and these can be due to mechanical hemolysis. So you might see this with a prosthetic heart valve or in one of the microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. So things like DIC, TTPHUS, or even HELP syndrome. Next, we have the bite cell or the degmocyte. Now these are seen in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiencies, and these are the consequence of the removal of Heinz bodies by splenic macrophages. Elliptocytes are easy to remember because they are seen in hereditary elliptocytosis. The name is in the disorder, which makes our lives a lot easier. Now this morphology is the result of a mutation in the genes that encode the RBC membrane proteins. Then we have spherocytes, and these are associated with hereditary spherocytosis, again, an easy one, but also autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Now, the way that these might be described to you in a vignette would be the presence of small spherical cells without central pallor. Then we have the macroovalocytes, which of course kind of gives it away here. These are found in megaloblastic anemia. Macroovalocyte, megaloblastic anemia. Okay, I will also in this instance, um, when it comes to megaloblastic anemia, of course, please be on the lookout for those hypersegmented neutrophils. Target cells are the final RBC morphology to be aware of here, and these just look like bullseyes. So these can be seen in cases of asplenia, in liver disease, thalassemia, as well as HBC disease. All right, now the next thing that you need to be aware of in your hemonc questions is the presence of RBC inclusions, because an RBC inclusion in a vignette can basically tell you what you're dealing with so that then you can just answer the question instead of trying to figure out what they're actually talking about. So we're going to do another matching exercise. Again, take as much time as you need. And then once you're done, come on back and we will go to the correct answers and talk about these inclusions and what they mean. So RBC inclusions. First, iron granules. And this is going to be found in the bone marrow. These are often described as ringed sideroblasts. And what this means is we see perinuclear mitochondria with excess iron. Now, in order to stain this, you probably will require the Prussian blue stain. So keep that in mind if you're given that information in a vignette or you're given an image, okay? This is associated with things like lead poisoning, myelodysplastic syndromes, as well as alcoholism. If we're looking at a peripheral smear, you always wanna be on the lookout for things like Heinz bodies, Howell Jolly bodies, basophilic stifling, and Pappenheimer bodies. So Howell Jolly bodies are basophilic remnants and they don't contain iron and their presence is indicative of functional hyposplenia or asplenia. Basophilic stifling refers to the presence of basophilic ribosomal precipitates that do not contain iron. And these are seen in thalassemias and in sideroblastic anemias. Pappenheimer bodies are basophilic granules that do contain iron and these are seen in sideroblastic anemia. And finally, we have the Heinz bodies, which are seen in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Now these inclusions are due to denatured and precipitated hemoglobin, and they also do contain iron. When Heinz bodies are removed via phagocytosis, we get something known as a bite cell. And one unique thing about the Heinz bodies is that if you wanna visualize it, it requires crystal violet. All right, so make sure you remember the different RBC morphologies, the different RBC inclusions. That will be the end of this lecture. 
In the next lecture, we're going to move on to questions pertaining to some important hemonc pathology that we absolutely need to know for our exam. <laughs>